We'll turn in our Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28 also holds your spot in uh, Colossians chapter 1. Matthew chapter 28 and also hold your finger in Colossians chapter 1. I didn't mention this in the announcement, but visitors, thank you for being here. We appreciate you here. We welcome you. And thank you for being in church this morning and being faithful to God's house. Amen. I've entitled this message, Just Go. Just Go. Or you get closely associated that with Nike. Just do it. That'd probably be a better time. Just do it. So we'll start off in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. And it says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, I pray that you will bless your word now uh, and, and do with it as you would, Lord. Let it accomplish that which it is going to do. Fill your preacher with the words that you would have me to say. Help me to stand behind the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. The Great Commission was given by our Lord Jesus Christ, as we see here. It was given for a purpose. And that purpose is to reach the lost souls for Jesus Christ. If we go to uh, verse 18, back in verse 18, it says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. If, uh, hold your spot there in Matthew 20. Go back to Colossians chapter 1. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 says this. Who is the invisible, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that in, are in earth. Whether they be visible or invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things are created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. In verse 18, and he is the head of the body, which is the church, who is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Amen. Jesus says, I have all power in the earth. He has all power. He is the invisible image of God manifested in human form. Amen. He's the bishop and shepherd of my soul. He's the head of my heart. He's the savior of my life. He's the master of my life. Psalm 22, 28 says this, For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. Jesus has all power in heaven, in the universe, and in earth. Amen. Number one, what I want you to see back in Matthew chapter 28 is this. In verse 19, the first three words, it says this, Go ye, therefore, the first command in the Great Commission is to go. To go. So we see, we see that. Go to Mark chapter 16. Mark 16. You can leave off Matthew for now, but maybe put a marker in there. Mark chapter 16. In verse 15, you'll see those same words. And Jesus, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world. Go. Luke chapter 24. We'll be right along this morning. We ain't wasting no time. No introduction. Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, verse 47. <coughs> And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. How can you preach among all nations without first going? Without first going. So therefore, not explicitly, explicitly stated here, but what the Lord Jesus was referring to is to first go. Go. John chapter 20. John chapter 20. Stay right with me. You're doing great. We just started. John chapter 20. Verse 21, John chapter 20 and verse 21, Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. Go, go, Acts chapter 1, two pages over, one page over in your Bible, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses Unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and into the uttermost part of the earth. Jesus is saying, again, how can you be a witness? How can you be a witness if you do not first go? 
You must go. You must go. Jesus is saying in all the Gospels, and, 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 and Acts included, you shall go. Go into all the world. Preach the Gospel. Go. 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 You don't need a call when you have a commandment. Amen? You don't need a, no one to say, hey, we need to go, we need to go soul today. It shouldn't even be a call. You have a commandment to obey. You have a commandment to obey. It is a mandate from the Lord Jesus Christ. But the problem is we don't even obey that. We would be way better off if we were just to go than to not go and disobey the Lord Jesus Christ and his commandment, his mandate to go and share the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ with the lost. Amen? Amen. A couple of you. But one of the, this is a problem. Some are hindered by fear. Some are hindered by fear. I'm going to take you back to the Old Testament. Let's go to Exodus chapter 14. Exodus 14. What does this have to do with the Great Commission? I don't know. Just go to Exodus 14. Just what God put in my heart. It's better off that we would go than to not go or, or never not go, if that makes sense. And to never go and be disobedient to the Lord Jesus Christ and His command to go, to reach the lost. But some are hindered by fear. So we see in Exodus 14 here, verse 14. The Lord shall fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore Christ thou unto me, speaking to the children of Israel, that they go forward. So now we're at, they're out of Egypt now, they're at the Red Sea. I didn't know it was going to be this way, God, but God says, don't worry, I got everything under control. And they say, hey, we'd be better off in Egypt. Moses, did you take us out here to die in the wilderness? We would have been better off eating in the flesh pots, eating the herbs, and being slaves, because they love being slaves for 430 years. No. Verse 16, but lift thou up thy rod and stretch out thy hand over the sea and divide it, and the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them, and I will get me honor upon Pharaoh, and upon all his host, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. Notice God's talking to Moses. He didn't say to the people, to, he didn't say to the people hey, I'm going to divide the sea. He just, told them, he just told Moses, hey, tell them to go forward. Tell them to go forward. Verse 18. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. Why did he do that? Verse 20, it came, to pass, and it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud and darkness to them, the Egyptians, so they couldn't see. But it gave light by night to these, the children of Israel, so that, they one, so that the one came not near the other all night. Verse 21, And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. God told Moses to tell the children to go forward. You don't think that they were afraid? They said, the Egyptians are behind us. We're totally afraid now. Why did you bring us out here to die? They were terrified of the, of the world's most powerful army was coming to slay them. They were terrified. Absolutely, they were terrified, and they were afraid to go forward. Go to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. The Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, and said this, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise and go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give them, even to the children of Israel. So God's speaking to Joshua, and he says, hey, I need you to go into, into, into the promised land. It's your job to take them over now. Verse 6, be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people thou shalt divide for an inheritance the land which I, say, which I swear unto their fathers, to give them, verse 7, only be thou strong and very courageous. Don't you think Joshua was afraid to go over? Absolutely he was. Why would God be telling him, hey, have good courage, be strong, do these things? Verse 9, have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage, and be not afraid. Don't tell me Joshua wasn't afraid. He's saying, don't be afraid. Be, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, wheresoever thou goest. So he goes into, uh, he sends the spies into Jericho. Remember, they meet Rahab. Rahab hides them, then they show, she shows them off. The, the two spies come back, and look what they say. Ver, uh, chapter 2, verse, uh, I'm sorry. 
Uh, look at chapter 2, verse 9. It says, And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. Look at their report. Verse 22. And they went and came unto the mountain and abode there three days until the pursuers were returned, so they left. Now they come back. Verse 23. The two men returned and descended from the mountain and passed over and came to Joshua the son of Nun and told him all things that befell them. And they said unto Joshua, Truly the Lord hath delivered into our hands all the land, for even all the inhabitants of the country do faint because of us. So the spies are talking to Joshua, giving a report to Joshua. He knows those spies, and only Joshua knows and God knows, that those inhabitants of the land are terrified. Joshua doesn't share this information with any of the children of Israel. He says, hey, I got the reports back. Everyone's terrified of us. Don't worry. No, because they're trusting God by faith, and they're going to go forward. And Joshua tries to encourage them here, and he says this. Verse 10 of chapter 3. And Joshua said, Hereby you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hevites, the Persianites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Jebusites, and the Termites. And he drives them out. Got that one over your head. <laughs> Joshua encourages them. The people didn't know. They were terrified to go over the land because they've heard ever since they were little kids, hey, there's giants in the land. We can't defeat them. And, say, and Joshua says, look, I mean, I'm scared too. I know you're scared, but we just got to go forward. Hindering. Fear hinders people. Amen? Amen? Well, that was the Old Testament, Pastor. We're in the New Testament now. I'm glad you said something. I'm glad you said that. And you know what? We have God in us in the New Testament. What are you talking about? 1 Corinthians 6.19. What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, ye, uh, which ye have of God, ye are not your own? You have the Holy Spirit of God in you. You have God in you through the person of the Holy Spirit. An unsaved man who gets born again, a, a regenerated soul through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's all of God, holy of God. Amen? He's the one who gives us boldness and power. Go to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. Why don't you take us to the New Testament and show that? Because some are hindered by fear. A lot of Christians today are hindered by fear. Fear of what? Fear of sharing their faith. A fear of being persecuted for their faith. A fear of the unknown. Otherwise we won't be afraid because it's known. If I, if I couldn't see inside of this cup, I'd be afraid of drinking it because I don't know if someone hawked a loogie or put some poison in there. But by faith, I'm just going to drink it. But I can also see in it as well. But if I couldn't see in it, I'm going to trust it by faith that I'm going to drink it because I know God told me to do it. So I'm going to do it anyway. That's a terrible illustration, by the way. Acts chapter 4. The Holy Spirit's the one who gives us boldness and power. Boldness and power. Acts chapter uh, uh, 3, it says uh, in verse 1, Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. So this man daily, this lame man daily is placed down at the temple, or at the gate of the temple. As people go by, he says, alms for the poor, alms for the poor. You know, we've seen the cartoons. He says this, verse 3, you've seen Peter and John, they're going into the temple to ask him of arms. And Peter, fastening his eyes on him, upon, uh, upon him with John, said, look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I give, I give thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk up. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Immediately. You know, when you're, when you're on the high, or when you're about to get on the highway or you're at a stoplight and you see uh, those homeless people asking for money, and what do we do? Oh, man, we've got to get my phone real quick. Okay, is he walking by? Yeah, he's gone. Just wasn't doing anything anyway. But then what did Peter and John do? They said, look on us! I don't have any money, but such as I have. And he shared Jesus Christ. says, stand up and walk. And he gives up his hand. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Where does he get that from? Go to chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse uh, 6. And Annas, the high priest, and uh, Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and as many as of were the kindred of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, who's them? Uh Chapter 3 of Acts, Peter and John. He set them in that they set them, Peter and John, in the midst. And they asked him what? How much money do you have? Where, did you pay your taxes this year? Um, 
did you speak in tongues to this man? No, they said, by what power? By, uh, by what power, by what name have you done this? What power did you do this? They were concerned of, uh, uh, they said, by what power by, or by what name did you do this? They were concerned if, if, if that man had a miracle. They, didn't, they weren't concerned of any of that. They said, what power did you do this? What, by, or by what name did you do this? They asked Jesus the same thing. What, what, what authority do you have? She said, I'll ask you a question. You, you answer me, and then I'll give you my opinion. I'll tell you what, but they couldn't. Verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and the elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to this impotent man, by what means is he made whole? Be it known unto you and to all the people of Israel by the, the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which has, was that set it, not of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Jesus is the cornerstone. And we stand on the solid rock, and we proclaim the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We say, stand up and walk. Uh, we don't have those powers. We can say, hey, I don't have any money, but what I can share with you is that the Lord Jesus Christ died for your soul, that you're a sinner, that there's a price for sin, which is you're going to spend an eternity in hell. God doesn't want you to go to hell because he commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus took the payment for your sin. You can only pay your sin if you spend an eternity forever and ever and ever in the lake of fire because God is just. God is holy, and he will not have it any other way. That's how he made it. Oh, what must I do to be saved? Repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Amen? Amen? Through the power of the Holy Ghost, standing on the solid rock, the Savior of my soul, uh, uh, understanding that we have the power in us of the Holy Spirit through the person of the Holy Spirit. Amen? You think these people were afraid. Go to uh, verse 23. Of that same chapter, of chapter 4. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice unto God. What did they hear? Well, Peter and John came back and gave a report to the other disciples that were there. And they said, and when they heard that, they lifted up their voice unto God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that them in there is. And they say this prayer. Go to jump, jump down to verse 29. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant to thy servant the gift of tongues. No. Granted to thy servant a million dollars. Granted to thy servant um, more rocks that we can throw at these people who are hurting us. Go, Lord, give us, give us, give us, give us, give us. No. It says, granted to thy servants with all boldness that we may speak thy word. That we may speak thy word. Give us boldness. They prayed for boldness. You think these people were hindered by fear? Absolutely they were. Because what did, what did, what did, what did, what <coughs> I'm sorry, I missed off a verse. Uh, verse 17 of chapter 4, but that it spread no further. They say, they say, hey, what should we do to these people? No, a, a miracle has been done. What do we do to these people now that they've done this miracle? And people have seen it. And they called them, in verse 18, and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus Christ. What did Peter and John say? Peter and John answered and said, that whether it be right in the sight of God to hear, more than God judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. It's in us. It's in our heart. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding them nothing, how they might punish them, because the people, for all men glorified God that which was, uh, for that which was done. They said, hey, all the people glorified and saw a miracle. We can't take them and give them some lashings. We can't take them and beat them. So we let them go. And they went to their own company, verse 23, and reported all that the chief and the elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice unto God. Why would they do that? Because they were afraid. They said, they commanded you guys, we can't preach in the name of Jesus anymore. Oh, Lord God of heaven and earth, please, grant unto thy servants, verse 29, behold their threatenings, Lord, grant unto thy servants with all boldness that they may speak the word. Do you think they were hindered by fear? Yes. That's why they prayed to God and said, God, we are so fearful. We, we were told by the command, you know, they were in direct opposition to some of the, uh, of, the, of the scribes and some of the rabbis that probably taught them when they were little kids. And now they're raised up, they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and now those teachers of the law, they're saying, it's by the Lord Jesus Christ thou shalt be saved, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us, and by the washing of regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Amen? And these rabbis are like, oh, you know, 
we're going to beat you if you keep talking in those names. And they lifted up their voice. They said, grant unto thy servants boldness to preach thy name. Give us boldness so that we can witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course they were in fear. Look at verse 30. By stretching forth thy hand to heal, that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, watch this, the place was, was shaken where they were assembled together and were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost going, No, they were filled with the power of the Holy Ghost because when the Holy Ghost gets inside you, when you are a saved man, when you are a saved woman, when you are a child of God, the Holy Spirit takes up residence inside. Amen. I, said, I believe I said that earlier, but I didn't. I'm telling you now. He takes up residence inside. But he's not always the president of every believer. He is the resident, but he's not always the president. When you get yourself out of there, get your pride out of there, get your self-ambitions out of there, you put God in there, you fill yourself in God and say, God, empty me of myself, fill me with thy spirit. He doesn't say, fill me with thy spirit so I can speak in tongues. He says, fill me with thy spirit so I can boldly proclaim the name of Jesus. That's what they're praying about. And God says, I will answer that prayer. The place was shaken. And what did they do? They spake the word of God with boldness. They spake the word of God with boldness. Right. Not with timidity. Not saying, hey, I just, I just, Because when you get filled with the Holy Spirit of God, if you're truly seeking the filling of the Holy Spirit, you will have boldness to preach. You don't give a rip where you're at. If you're in a subway, if you're in an ice skating rink, if you're in a Burger King, if you're on the street corner, if you're in a grocery store. That happened to me this uh, on, on Friday. I was talking to a man. I was sharing my testimony of another woman told me she was a Catholic. I was like, hey, let me share you what I told her. And a lady comes by. I helped her get some milk or whatever. Thank you. She comes back again hears me saying, I said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? She said, are you asking that question? I said, yeah. What must I do to inherit eternal life? She said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what I'll be saying. I said, amen. She said, but there's a whole lot more than that. You got 30 minutes? I was like, no, I really don't. But there's a lot more than that. Excuse me, if I understand I'm a sinner, I understand there's a penalty for my sin, I understand that Jesus paid the price, and if I call and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as my only hope for eternal security and salvation, that's how I get saved. She says, no, no, no. I said, you're wrong, and that's blasphemy, whatever you're saying, whatever's going to come out of your mouth right now. And she took off down the road. And the guy over here said, hey, man, you better watch out. You're going to offend people. I said, excuse me, they offend my Savior every day by taking his name in vain. They offend me. Why can't I say and proclaim truth of the Lord Jesus Christ? Thank God I didn't get kicked out of that store. <laughs> but in and of myself, oh, Pastor, that's just you because you talk to people. That's your personality. No, honestly, uh, sometimes I get terrified to talk to people, too, about the Lord Jesus Christ. because, And I'm sure anybody could fit themselves in the shoe and say, well, I'm kind of, I'm kind of scared. I don't, I don't know what they'll say. I don't, I don't want to be rejected. But if you're filled with the Holy Ghost... He's the one that gives you power. He's the one that gives you that boldness to preach the name of Jesus, whatever may happen. Look at Stephen. Stephen lifts up and says, y'all killed the man, right, in all his little sermon. I don't remember all that. I memorized it all. But he says, y'all did this. Y'all killed the holy child Jesus. He's the one that God has lifted up, and he, through him we have salvation. They, they, they plug their ears and they stone him to death. It says, God, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But why would Stephen do that? Why would he go into a, a, a religious a sect and, and just proclaim Jesus because he was filled, a man filled with the Holy Spirit of God? Not filled to speak in tongues to show off how awesome he is or whatever. He says, hey, I'm filled with the Spirit, and the, the filling of the Holy Spirit is always to give us boldness to proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ and witness for him. Amen. They spake the word of God with boldness. That means they first had to go out in obedience. They had to go out in obedience. They took the commission of our Lord to heart, and they also took it personally. They didn't say, oh, that's just for the apostles, because Jesus was speaking to the apostles. That, that, that's just for them. We don't have to do it. No, they took it personally. They took it, they, they took it very personally, because that's God's command to us as well, and each individual believer, to go out and be a witness for Jesus Christ. Why be a Christian and sit on the bench on the sidelines while everybody else is playing the field? And you lay up for yourselves wood, hand, stubble. I want, to have, I want to lay up gold, silver, and precious stones so that Jesus can one day say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Don't you? They say, That's just for the apostles. Neither should we say, That's just for the pastor. That's his job. No, that's every Christian's job. Amen. It is incumbent upon every believer who is a child of God to be a witness for Jesus Christ and to right. win the lost. 1 John 4.18 says this, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. Why fear? Whom shall I fear? If God be for us, who can be against us? Why fear? 
I want you to notice their prayer back in uh, verse 24. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord. Their prayer was adoration. Adoration. Who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? I'm sorry, I didn't even finish off that first, uh, verse 24, I'm sorry, second part. And said, Lord, thou art God, which hast made heaven and earth and the sea and that all in them is. What we fail to do as Christians a lot is give God adoration. God, you are the sovereign. God, you are the creator. God, you are the most merciful God. Give him adoration before, but we, what we do is a lot of supplication. David, uh, who by the mouth of thy servant David said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine, va imagine va vain things? The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anoint anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and with the people of Israel, were gathered together. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined to do before, determined before to be done. So they, they, they call him the creator. They call him the sovereign. Because he's in charge. He's ruling everything. The wisdom of God, in verse 28, to do whatever, whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined to do before to be done. The foreknowledge of God is shown in there. They're giving God adoration. God, look at all the things you've done. Look at what these people have done, but because you ordained it, you set it up, you had the foreknowledge. God knew what was going to happen. He's in control. Amen? Their prayer was adoration. Number two, their prayer was sincere and heartfelt. And their prayer was supplication. And it was specific. What do you mean? Lord, thank you for this food. Uh, uh, thank you for this day. And I uh, just pray to have a good day. And uh, that's it. That's all we talk to God all day. But the Bible says, cease. What is it? Don't stop praying. Don't stop praying. Don't stop talking to God. God, I just want to talk. I just want to talk. But Lord, even more importantly, verse 29, Lord, behold their threatenings and granted thy servants with all boldness they may speak thy word. Specific prayer. Lord, I, 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 have, I have an aunt who needs to get saved. Lord, I, I, I pray that you can use me or use people in her life, encourage her, and I just pray for her salvation. Do you have anyone on your prayer list that you're praying for salvation? If you don't, it's time. It's about high time you do. You have family members. You have friends. You have coworkers. You have somebody... Why not you go witness to them? Well, I'm afraid. We have, the, we have the power of the Holy Spirit. We have a very present help in the person and power of the Holy Spirit. What was he saying? He filled them and gave them boldness. Why? Why would, why would God give them boldness? Why would God answer their prayers? Because their prayer was sincere in asking for it. They were sincere and they really cared about souls. Do you care about souls this morning? Do you care about people getting saved honestly? Luke eleven thirteen says this, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? John 14, 16, And I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another comforter, that He may abide with you forever. The Holy Spirit is with you forever. In verse 26, that same chapter, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, He shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Verse 27, Let not your heart be troubled, Neither let it be afraid. 2 Timothy 1, 7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Notice in verse 32 here of this chapter, Acts chapter 4. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. What is that? One heart and of one soul. Everyone. What is that? Unity. Unity. They had unity. Why? Because they were sincere and asking for boldness of the Holy Ghost. So give us boldness to preach your name. Lord, we care about souls. We're sincere in our prayer. And we want to reach people with the good news of Jesus Christ. And in verse 31, they spake the word of God with all boldness. If I'm being repetitive, I just want you to get it. They prayed for boldness. They prayed for the filling of the Holy Spirit to give them boldness. And when that was done, multitude of, um, and the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one spirit one soul. God loves unity. Amen? He is not the author of confusion. God loves unity. He loves order. All these believers wanted it. Wanted what? The power to witness. They wanted the power to witness. They didn't ask God, please give us more money in my 401k. Lord, help, 
help this. And, and that's okay to pray for those things. But most importantly, what did Jesus Christ come to do? He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He didn't come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. And we should have that same priority. Jesus' last command should be our number one priority. You know, if, if, so, if, if someone's experienced, or not yourself, but you've been in, uh, uh, you've had a relative pass, or if you've been around death, sometimes they give you those last words or their last living will and testament. They'll write something out. Those words in and of themselves are just words that they've said, that they've given you, right? It's just like, it's just like anything else. Or does it mean something special because it's the last words they said before they left this earth? special, it's important. Same thing with the Great Commission. Jesus said, hey, I'm going away, but I need you to go into all the world and preach the gospel, baptize them, and teach them all things. And they're like, there he goes. What do we do now? Why stand ye here gazing up into heaven? This same man will come back to you again in the same like manner. Go out and go! Go and reach the lost. And it's a personal command. It's a personal mandate that we have to believe. Soul winning for our church is at 9.30 on Saturdays. I probably failed to mention that, but I'm letting you know now again, and I will not do that anymore. 9.30 Saturday, 9.30 a.m., nursery is provided. So if you have children, you can drop them off at nursery, and we will go out and reach people with the gospel. Amen? <clears throat> Jesus said go. They prayed, and they went. This church can have just some witnessing, but it needs all witnessing. Do you care about the lost? Do you honestly care if people die and go to hell? Do you have a fresh look at Jesus and His holiness and say, God, I know you've called me for a specific reason. I'm just going to sit here. And I understand not everyone can go out because of physical inabilities or whatever, but pray for us who do go out. But if you don't have any physical ailments, you don't work or whatever, you have no excuse to not go out and reach the lost. I'm not saying you always have to come to the church going soul winning, but not, I, I guarantee nine times out of ten you're not going to go soul winning all by yourself. That's why, we, that's why I schedule a time. I say, hey, this is when we're going to go out. This, this is what I like. What I, uh, this is what I can do. Uh, well, pastor, you're just a pastor. I have a full-time job. I have a full-time ministry. I have a full-time family. You think I don't have time? Nobody got time. you got to carve out time. You have to carve out time, otherwise you won't do it. You need to set a date. You need to set a time. You need to set a place and follow up and go. Because Jesus says, go. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Amen. It is incumbent upon all Christians to go and be a witness. It's a personal command. It's not an option. I'm done through the sermon. What I'm going to share with you is this. A man whose name is Raymond Lull, with two L's. He was born in 1234, and he died in 1315. He lived in uh, Morocco. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure it's that. In the Mediterranean Sea. It's an island off the, off the coast of Spain. Near the beach of Palma Bay, at 36, year old, 36 years old as a knight, this was during the time of the Crusades, the last of the four off days of the Crusades, he was dreaming of Africa. He had only heard stories from sailors, but never set his eyes upon its ports. His father took part in the last crusade. But Raymond stood aside, for he was planning a new crusade, a kind unlike that had any gone on before. He dreamed of going to Africa, where the crescent of Muhammad ruled and where the cross of Christ was never seen, except when a Muslim drew it in the sand and spit on it to defame Christ. He was rich enough to sail out there at any time because he was his own master, and he had much money. But why didn't he? His deep resolve was that at all costs he would be prepared for every counterstroke of the Saracen whose tongue was as swift and sharp as a scimitar sword. So he started to learn Arabic from a Saracen slave, and he started studying the Quran. He and the Saracen argued one time, and they uh, together, causing Raymond to smite him in the face, and that Saracen pulled out a dagger and jammed it into his side. They took the Saracen out, and he later hung himself in his jail cell, but he ended up learning Arabic. Time had passed, and he found himself in Genoa, Italy, and found a ship that was sailing across the Mediterranean to Africa. He booked his passage, sent his goods with all his manuscripts aboard, and the sailing date come. But as he sat in his room trembling and thinking of the persecuting of the Saracens of Tunis in Africa, he was sailing to meet, and the dungeon that possibly he could be in, and even more uh, 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 importantly, the, the execution of his sword. He simply did not go. He had everything packed. He booked his passages. He, he got all of his manuscripts ready, got all his baggages ready to go. But he didn't go. 
He was in such bitter shame, and he, it threw him into a high fever, and soon after he heard another ship that was sailing to Africa, so not second chance. He was carried to the ship because the fever that he had made him be in bed rest. He couldn't even walk. That's how high his, and bad his fever was from the shame that he said, I, I told Jesus that I wanted to do these things, but I just couldn't get myself to do it because he was afraid. But his friends carried him off. It, 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 they, put him on the, they put him on the ship, and, he, and, and his friends, with, be, with him pleading, his friends carried him off the ship, despite his pleading, saying, no, leave me on the ship, leave me on the ship, i got to go. They said, no, you can't. We, can't, we can't let you go. Ship number two. Soon after, ship number three comes and makes ready to sail. This time, Lowell was carried again on board and refused to return. The ship was cast off and headed for the open sea. From this moment, I was a new man. All fever left me almost before we were out of sight of land. That's all uh, Raymond's words. He made it to the Gulf of Tunis in Tanzania, Africa, the, the northern spot of Africa, a little bit on the eastern border. Excuse me. The mighty city of the western Mohammedan world, the Muslim world. It was a great city. He found a mosque where some bearded men were bent over talking about the Quran and talking about the law of Muhammad. He boldly came up and said this, I have come to talk with you about Christ and his way of life and Muhammad and his teaching. If you can prove to me that Muhammad is indeed the prophet, I will become myself a follower of him. And many days of arguments, after many days of arguments, many of the Muslims were siding with law. And a strange thing was occurring and people were becoming converted to Christianity. To forsake the faith of Muhammad is to uh, embrace death in those countries, still in today. Excommunication from that. Lowell was thrown into prison, later thrust into ship, to, headed back to Genoa, and he was told, you can never come back to this place. What did Lowell do? Did he stay on the ship? No, he got off. He snuck off the ship. And he taught for a year. <clears throat> and he moved westward along the African coast, or maybe if you're looking westward along the African coast. He taught there for a year on, on the, uh, some cities, and finally, when it was time, he came out of hiding to boldly proclaim Christ. Notice he, he was 81 years old when he died. Several years had gone by. He traveled back up into Paris and rode across the mountains to back into Italy. He sailed back from Italy back to Africa to boldly proclaim Christ. Said, "All right," and he's hiding in these and he's hiding in these villages, leading people to Christ, witnessing for Jesus Christ. He's an old man, and finally, when it was time and God led him, he said, "I'm going to boldly proclaim the name of Jesus Christ." So one day in the marketplace of Bougia. Lowell, with an arm outstretched, was declaring the love of God shown in Jesus Christ his Son. The Saracens, or the Muslims, murmured. They could not answer his arguments. They couldn't contend with him. They cried to him to stop, but his voice was ever fuller and bolder for Jesus Christ. They rushed on him, dragged him by the cloak outside the city's wall, rolled up their sleeves, took a great jagged stones, hurled them at Lowell until he sank senseless into the ground. Did Lowell accomplish anything? Did, did, no, did, did, he, did, he, did he honestly accomplish anything? He smiled on the men who stoned him just as, uh, just as Stephen did in the book of Acts. God forgive them for they know not what they do. He, shown the, he, 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 fl he flown the white, the white flag at Genoa on that first ship. He said, I, don't, I, can't, I can't go. It was, shown, it was so shameful, I told you. He, he threw himself into a high fever. And it took three more ships to come until he said, I will go. I will be obedient to the Great Commission. Now we define death in the marketplace of Bougia. And in that love and heroism, in the face of hate and death, he, shown, he had shown men the only way to conquer the scimitar of Muhammad is this, that he wrote, the way in which Christ and his apostles achieved it, namely by love and prayers and the pouring out of blood and tears. He converted many sinners to Christ, but it all started with him obeying the first command to go. To go. He went and he obeyed Christ's command. Fulfilling the Great Commission is certainly sending missionaries across the sea, but it's also taking the gospel across the street. The apostles were obedient to that command. The Christians in the early churches were obedient to that command. Many a missionary, many, a, many an evangelist, many a pastor have been obedient to that command. Even many a Christian have been obedient to that command. Now let me ask you, will you go? Will you go and be obedient to the Lord's command to preach the gospel to every creature in all the world? Take the gospel across the street. And proclaim Jesus Christ? Or are you going to sit on the sidelines and let other people do it? And stand before God one day and say, I had so much more planned for you. Why wouldn't you share the gospel? Uh, imagine if I had a cure for cancer. I have the cure for cancer, but I'm holding it all to myself. You have the truth of the gospel. 
We have the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have a way to get to heaven. But what many a Christian do is says, no, it's all for me. I'm not going to share it. And we don't say that with our words, but you show the Lord by your actions that you do not share the gospel message with Jesus Christ. For those of you in this church who do come out so morning, I thank you. And I want to encourage you to keep going for Jesus Christ. Your, your, your labor is not in vain, is what Jesus says. But for of you that are in this church, I want to use this as, as a, a charge or a, just a little nudge and say, hey, maybe you need to get into soul winning. Maybe you need to carve out some time in your schedule. Maybe you really need to pursue the filling of the Holy Spirit and ask for boldness in your daily walk with Jesus Christ and proclaim truth. Will you go? Will you go? Let's pray.